Let's bring in Mohan Bashar, Al Jazeera senior political analyst. Uh, as we said to our correspondents, a, a day to remember, but also one to ponder about the future. I mean, the Nakba has historical meaning right now, but even that historical meaning is changing with time. It is to some to some degree, but I've actually have always wondered why do the Palestinians commemorate the Nakba, since it's an ongoing process. The catastrophe didn't happen in a day or in a year. It has continued over 75 years, nonstop. And none of the issues, none of the underlining issues that made it a catastrophe back in 1947-49 have changed. Refugees are still refugees. Dispossession is still dispossession. Occupation increased over the years. Repression and racism increased over the years. Israel's supremacy and the supremacy of Zionism in the land of Palestine have increased over the years. So it's been 75 years of continued catastrophe, topped this year and last year, of this, what they called, even the Israelis themselves, as you've reported earlier, calling it the new Nakba, the Nakba of Gaza. Which really goes a long way to tell you um, that uh, what we've seen back 75 years ago and continues today it requires a solution, the solution that is not being provided. And why does it require a solution? Say, unlike, you know, when we commemorate, I don't know, First, first World War or the Holocaust or what have you, right? So it's an event that happened at one point in time, more or less. But here, this requires a solution. It requires a, a, a historical context in the sense that, and I've heard some of your discussion with your previous guests, is it worse? Is it better? And, you know, better, well, not better, but is it worse? You know, comparing the incomparable horrors that happened to the Palestinians. There is something to be said about that. What happened in 1947-49 was a major disaster for the Palestinians because most of them were displaced. This time around, Israel is unable to displace Palestinians outside Gaza except a number of them that decided that just need, could, not, could not tolerate anymore, or they were killed or, 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 or sick or, or what have you, right? So we are stuck, and Israel is stuck today with more than seven and a half million Palestinians living in historic Palestine. So the project of displacing, of ethnic cleansing the Palestinians has basically failed. And that's definitely important to recall. And you say it needs reform, it needs to be answered, it needs to be dealt with. We've got the, the, the World Economic Forum happening in Doha right now, uh, and there are statements coming out of it, certainly from the Saudis, about the fact it says without a real political pathway, it'd be very difficult for Arab countries to discuss how we are to govern, i.e., lower the temperature, make sure there's a two-state solution, and be behind the Palestinians. I mean, this is a, a conversation that's happening between Saudi, Qatar, the United Arab Emirates, and Egypt. How important is it that these countries are, you might say, standing up or standing together in this forum, not just in Doha, but generally, globally? It's important to a certain degree that, at least in terms of their declaration, the Arab regimes seem to be in agreement that what's going on today, seven months later, is horrible. It's a, a genocide of some sort. But just as they were divided in 1947, 1949, just as they were impotent in 1974, 1979, 1947, 1949, yeah. they are as impotent and as divided today and incapable of stopping a genocide that's taking place. If this genocide was taking place, as it were, for example, you know, in Bosnia and, and other places, the Europeans intervened. And there were a number of war criminals from Serbia taken to The Hague. But in our region, in this region, Arab leaders are incapable of taking care of uh, or, or preventing or stopping a genocide that's unraveling in plain sight. The only people who are capable and have been more capable than before of doing something about it are the Palestinians. And this is the central point here, because if the Palestinians did not stand up for their rights, I don't think the, Arabs would, the Arab regimes would have over the past. In fact, Palestine was going to become a comma, right, a semicolon in this region if the Arab regimes and Netanyahu would have had it their way. Now, after October 7, things have changed, there's no doubt. What's really most important to understand is that while the Palestinians have been pummeled, while they have been beaten again and again and again, 
why Israel has won one war after another war, at least until 1967. Israel might have won, but the Palestinians have never lost. They have never recognized their loss in terms of strategic loss to Israel. So until today, 75 years, they are still struggling. They are still fighting. They are still steadfast. If the Palestinians wouldn't lose, Israel cannot win. And if we just develop this a little bit more, you know, we talk about, and we talked only just last week about this whole American arms shipment being paused or not. Um, it reminds me of the phrase, because we're hearing now that this arms shipment is going ahead, of the Native American Indians who would often say, you know, white man speak with forked tongue. Yeah. And now we have this scenario where one minute it's a pause, one minute we're sending arms to Israel. It, it's all about the USA and whether you can actually trust what they say. This is the thing that uh, our correspondent Kimberly out of Washington said about uh, how the atmosphere in Washington is uh, Biden trying to walk a fine line, a thin line, trying to balance between uh, freezing uh, am am ammunition shipments and at the same time selling Israel new weapons, which is kind of a contradiction in term, right? On the one hand, you say, I'm not going to send the, the ammunition, but I'm going to sell more than a billion dollars of new weapons to Israel. Now, you could say that, as Biden put it, well, this is used for Rafah, the other one is used to defend Israel. It's a bit of a fine line, yeah. right, between both. But as you stated earlier, I think I heard you in one of your interviews, it's like, that, like the West stood with Israel back in 1948. It's standing with Israel today. But there's a big difference. In 1948, the West was still trying to cover up its complicity or role or whatever in the Holocaust. And Israel was basically came out of the ashes of the Holocaust only a few years later. For the past 75 years, there was no Holocaust. If, any, if anything, it's the Palestinians that have paid the real price of the Holocaust. 75 years later, the West cannot say I am complicit for cause of the Holocaust. So they tried to manufacture this whole humbug of anti-Semitism. There is no issue more fought in the West than anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is banned in the West. So to provoke or to invoke the question of anti-Semitism in order to be implicit or complicit in supporting Israel, that's a sham. And we'll leave it there for now, but continue to uh, follow what happens as well. Thanks very much for your analysis. Uh, Mohan Bashara there, our senior political analyst. Make sure to subscribe to our channel to get the latest news from Al Jazeera.